G'day and welcome to episode 21 of The Other Side Australia. Gosh, we're 21, how nice. Uh, we're coming to you on video on the Discernible platform and the Good Source platform, YouTube, and in audio on all good podcast platforms. This is the podcast which attempts to give some voice to fair criticism of the left-wing thinking that dominates modern Australian education and public discourse in some parts of our country, and reminding you that there are some other intelligent conservatives and classical liberals out there, and you are not alone. On this week's show, COVID fear. It's right to be afraid of this thing. It's horrible. And what's happening in the UK is horrible but not so afraid here in Australia that we destroy ourselves in the process and adopt a cure that's worse than disease. Another Labor Premier facing a state election decides to beat up the crisis to play hero and win support. And another Liberal opposition takes the bait and falls right into the trap destined to lose big time at the ballot box. We'll take a deep look at the latest moves of WA's Mark McGowan and check in on what Chairman Dan is up to in Victoria, extending the state of emergency for a year. All unnecessary steps to fight COVID-19 and to keep you safe and all very politically motivated. I'll also put my nerd hat on and we'll dive into the statistics on COVID's tragic impact in the UK as well. We'll also reveal just how utterly naive and foolish our friends in New Zealand are being in their handling of China's trade dispute with Australia. I'll share an amazing interview about the need for unity and understanding across the political divide from two men who are far better and more patient and tolerant humans than me. We'll have our usual education spot focusing a bit on liberal economics this week and why stimulus spending the government handing out free money, is not such a great idea. And tax cuts do not just advantage the rich. We'll hear from one of America's greatest economists, Thomas Sowell. Matt Wong, my discernible colleague, will make an appearance and we'll have our usual anti-woke comedy clip. It's a big one. Get ready for some cognitive dissonance and actual complex thinking. Let's go. West Australian Premier Mark McGowan continues to keep his state's citizens prisoners in their own homes, despite there being zero locally acquired cases of COVID-19. Once upon a time, Australia was a free country and deprivation of liberty was considered an extremely serious thing to do, something you only did in the most dire circumstances, a foreign invader bombing our cities, a, a very lethal pandemic that had a very real threat of becoming very widespread, perhaps. But it seems that all of our leaders, state and federal, are happy to overwield their power and pay zero regard to civil liberties and any sense of balanced risk management or proportionality. COVID-19 is a horrendous disease. In all stages of this debate, I've tried to return to the data. We're taking precautions in Australia to prevent a UK-type outbreak until the vaccines can be rolled out to the whole population. For an insight into the UK picture, we took in a few videos, including this one from the BBC. It's scarier, it's bigger. I, I never thought it would be possible to have this many intensive care patients. So you're full, is that right? It's still coming, go, go, go. Let's secure that. He could die from this, by the way, I'm sorry to have to say that. So we're now gonna run into a problem because we haven't got any beds. As London sleeps, the night shift begins at the Royal London Hospital. Nursing sister Carleen Kelly makes her way to a job that's crushing her in the middle of the COVID nightmare. Sleep isn't what it used to be. This is Whitechapel. There's anxiety when you wake up and you, you remember what you have to go into. We're fragile and um, angry. In pressurised rooms, the patients receive oxygen through masks, their condition monitored, but who may need more sustained help from a ventilator. Keep it sat below 96. One man's breathing badly falters. Just do it, just do it, just do it. He must be intubated fast. And we watch as medics put him to sleep and push a long plastic tube down his throat, hooking him up to his new breathing machine. When he'll wake up, no one knows. 
I was so naive the first time. I wasn't convinced we were going to have a second wave at all. And the huge numbers that have just absolutely slammed us um, is just, it, we, I, I never thought it would be possible to have this many intensive care patients, not at all. Martin Freeborn said he yeah. wanted to speak to us. Uh, my wife lost a, a fight for life. Um, it was a mixture of COVID and an, an infection um, that finally finished her off. And this is literally in the last few minutes? Yeah, 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 in the last half hour. I've lost her. Her name was Helen and she was 64. What's your message to people watching this who perhaps feel that there is no COVID, there is, there is no battle that everyone it is fighting? Make, it makes me really angry. No, no, nobody wants to go through this. I wouldn't wish this on anybody. This, this really is horrible. It's real. And people really do need to look after themselves and take care because... You don't want this to happen. I wouldn't wish this on anybody. Um, I, yeah, please wake up and please be over careful. You can't do enough to keep yourself safe. Don't end up like us, please. Horrible stuff. It's the sort of story that makes you want to do anything to make it go away. But our leaders don't have that luxury. They have to weigh up the benefits of whatever measures they take against the dangers and trauma and impact on lives and livelihoods that, their measures, that, that the measures they decide to take will have. It's not a choice between life and death. It's the worst choice of all, between death and death. So they must put the emotion to one side and look at the data and weigh up all the risks. Here are the deaths in the UK up to January 22. This data comes from the UK government's official statistics website, and we'll put the link in the program notes. Since March, almost six in 100 Brits have tested positive to COVID-19. That's 3.8 million people. Out of those, 3% have died. There've been 107,000 deaths. That's one out of every 623 Brits. For perspective, the total number of deaths from all causes in the UK is usually around 600,000 each year, and that number is up about 10% for 2020. Now, what about age breakdowns? Of the 107,000 deaths, more than 1,000 have now been in people under the age of 44, 10,000 between 45 and 64, 16,000 between 65 and 74, at least three quarters of the deaths, 78,000 in the over 75 bracket. So even with things as bad as they are in the UK and with all the international arrivals that they've had into their country, we can only be sure that COVID-19 was the leading cause of death of somewhere between 15 and 29,000 people under the age of 75. That's three out of every 10,000 people under 75. Usually 20 out of every 10,000 people under 75 die in the UK each year from all causes. Anyway, back to Australia. When you're making decisions in a crisis, there are two things you must not do. First, you must not abdicate responsibility to just one group of your advisors. It's not okay to say, I am following the medical advice or I'm doing whatever the CHO or CMO says. You should heavily weight what they say in your decision making, but you have more to do than just that. You need to think big picture and not be swayed by the emotionality of the moment. You must get advice from other experts, put it all together and make a decision based on all of the advice. The second thing you mustn't do in a crisis is let politics come into your decision making in any way, shape or form. Do the right and responsible thing and the politics should look after itself. So despite how scary COVID-19 is and the reality of the world's worst affected large country, the UK, I don't think that we need to be as overcautious and do more harm than good as our leaders in Australia seem to be doing now. This is just too much. We have one case in WA. We know how they got it. And the chance of community transmission is very, very small. We can't let our leaders lock down an entire city over that. It's insane. How can thinking Labour supporters not be completely mortified at what they're seeing their premiers doing? Labour used to stand for civil liberties 
and freedom and justice. And now it stands for big government and centralized state control. It's not the party of the little guy or the battler anymore. It's the party of the new bureaucratic woke elites. As for the Liberal Party's response to it all, cowering in fear of an electoral backlash instead of leading, I'll get to that in a sec. But first, here's the best commentary I could find on the WA situation for your weekly summary. It's from Sky News' Chris Kenny, who tells a tale of the kind of unnecessary anguish and personal trauma that big government blanket interventions like this that are ill thought out can cause. What about this one? A couple are getting married this Friday afternoon in the southern highlands of New South Wales. The groom's family has already flown into the area. They came into Sydney the other day, but they arrived after the WA lockdown was declared. So they've been forced to isolate in their hotel until Friday night after the wedding. They're sitting in their hotel 10 minutes away from the wedding venue, but unless sanity prevails, they'll miss it. And get this, this is despite the fact they've tested negative for COVID-19. And despite the fact that they're going to be free to leave that hotel, even under these onerous, over-the-top nanny state rules, they're going to be free to leave their hotel just six hours later, six hours after the wedding. This is cruel, it's heartless, it's unjustified, it's stupid. It's their son's wedding. What is the risk to the people of New South Wales? What is the proportionate response? We have deliberately turned ourselves from the lucky country and the clever country into the stupid country. We're scared, frightened, paranoid and idiotic. It's embarrassing. But all the evidence now is that most of the population is happy to defer to politicians making these decisions because they defer to the medical advice alone. You don't need a medical degree to understand how to stop infections. But what you do need as a politician is the judgment to understand the costs and benefits, the risks and proportionate responses, how to find the balance between minimising the effects of a new virus and still maintaining a viable community, society and economy. McGowan says he reckons Perth will be out of lockdown by Friday evening if Western Australia continues to record zero community cases. Gee, thanks, mine Fuhrer. Anyway, at least they have an election coming up in WA, so the Liberal opposition will be onto it, right? Wrong. The local opposition leader is a guy named Zach Kirkup, who won the election after, sorry, won the leadership after a spill just before Christmas. He's 33 years old. Out of everyone in the state of Western Australia, the Liberal Party seems to think a 33-year-old will appeal to the public. I mean, he seems like a very smart and nice kid, but 33? Who has the life experience required to be a state premier at 33? Obviously, they aren't expecting to win and no one wants to take the fall because of Mark McGowan's huge popularity. It didn't work for Deb Frecklington in Queensland to sit on the fence on COVID. She lost the unlosable election to Anastasia Palaszczuk in November. So instead of coming out with a clear differentiated message about how the Liberals would provide more balanced and sensible approach to management, keeping Western Australians safe, yes, while at the same time doing everything possible to respect civil liberties and minimise collateral damage, what do we get? We get gutlessness. Well, gutlessness doesn't win elections, Zach. Maybe if you were 10 years older, you'd know that. But the older people advising you must have missed the Queensland election. Everyone seems terrified. Labor premiers are terrified of even one case of COVID messing up their record. You can die by the thousands from smoking cigarettes as people do. You can die from lockdown induced depression, anxiety, from cancer undetected because you couldn't get your annual checkup. Die any way you like. Just do not on my watch die from COVID. I'll take away all your civil liberties for that. McGowan has an election coming up, and Dan, well, he's just Dan. But it's also the Liberal Party who are terrified, terrified of the public backlash if they don't support the extreme lockdowns. The media, terrified of losing audience share and relishing in the fear-mongering and positive effect on their ratings at the moment, so who'd want to give that up? The last gasp of traditional broadcast media. So who's really to blame here? Us. The so-called quiet Australians for being quiet. We have to speak out more. We have to challenge the fear narrative. We have to speak out in public and at work 
and at social gatherings if there are any anymore. No, Bob, Jane, David, Ahmed, Sanjeev, Deepa, Carlos. We need to say, I don't think this is proportional to the risk. I am more scared by the lockdowns and the damage they'll do. I'm more scared by the power that's being centralized in the hands of so few leaders and bureaucrats and the lack of debate in the media. I'm scared about the precedents we're setting for the future. I'm scared about where all this may lead. Because if you give an inch, they take a mile. Speaking of which, Dan Andrews is back to his old tricks, taking a mile. He announced this week that the state of emergency legislation sunset date, the date when that state of emergency legislation can't be extended beyond, that date will be now extended to December 15. And he says, don't go thinking the vaccine will solve our problems. You still need big government. You still need Dan's government to take care of you. Uh, and even once we have hopefully a very significant majority of Victorians that have had that jab, uh, what we know is that both the vaccines that are being used, there's still some doubt about uh, whether they will protect against infection and the transmission of this virus. There's certainly very good evidence and it's very heartening to think that we'll be able to protect people from really significant illness, but the notion that people could still have the virus and, and pass it on will mean that things like hotel quarantine will for quite some time be a feature of our COVID normal. Therefore, uh, we need to extend that state of emergency and we will extend it until the 15th of uh, December. I'm confident we'll get a good outcome that, that makes sure we've got a rule book and a statutory framework that helps all of us protect the precious thing that we have built. Ah, yes, the precious thing that we have built. Let me explain the political psychology here because it's straight out of the communist playbook. Government takes away something that it has no right to take away, your freedom. Then, when you behave yourself like a good child, government gives it back to you. Then, having become so used to not having the thing that they took away, you're filled with relief and gratitude to your dear leaders because they gave it back. We saw that with the joyous praising of Dan after he put out the fire he started at the end of the Victorian lockdowns last year. Many Victorians simply forgot that his government was the metaphorical arsonist in the first place. Then, once they've given back your freedom and you're thanking them for it, the government warns you that if you don't behave, it'll have to take it away again. Let's not lose what we've all worked so hard to build. But you're not falling for it because you're smart, right? Please tell me you're not falling for it. Here's more from the master manipulator. The sorts of rules that the state of emergency un underpins is the order for someone to isolate for 14 days, is the order that means hotel quarantine is mandatory, uh, wearing face masks in certain settings, all of those common sense things, uh, but particularly hotel quarantine, without a state of emergency, the Chief Health Officer simply has no power to be able to compel people to isolate in a hotel. Uh, we wouldn't want a situation where because we didn't have a legal framework we had to stop receiving returning Aussies wanting to come home. So that's why we've put this bill in, in we'll put this bill into the parliament today. Oh he he is good. We wouldn't want to lose those gains we've all made. It's also terribly reasonable isn't it? He's non -ver he's so reasonable. He's almost as good an emotional actor as the sign language lady standing next to him. There's just one problem. He's lying. You can check out my colleague Matthew Wong's analysis later on the discernible platform for the legal background to all of this, but it's pretty simple. Here's a little clip of Matt's video. You can extend a state of emergency every 30 days until the maximum length of time, which was six months. Then we had this big fight about it back in September of 2020, my original video, because he wanted to extend it to 18 months, so a further 12 months. So it would have been a total of States of emergency can be redeclared every 30 days for a period of up to 18 months instead of six because it was running out in September. It was running up to the six month mark. We kicked up a fuss. Everyone kicked up a fuss and said, no, 18 months, mate, that's ridiculous. So, so they negotiated and they lost by one or two votes in the upper house that he got the legislation through with a, a six month extension. Uh, so now states of emergency can be declared for um, up to 12 months in the case of COVID. And he also altered the definition of 
um, substantial risk of material harm to the public to include when there are no COVID cases uh, for an indefinite period of time here or in neighbouring states of Australia. And that's exactly what we have now. They're able to declare states of emergency even when we have zero cases. Zero cases. You can declare a state of emergency even when there are zero cases. Silly me. I thought you had to actually have a, an actual emergency before you could do something as serious to declare a state of emergency in a liberal democracy. I might as well move back to Hong Kong or the Philippines. I'm sure there'd be plenty of lefties who chip in for my ticket if I promise never to come back. Anyway, the serious bit, the lying bit, where Dan is being really sneaky and deceptive here, is that he hasn't told you that these state of emergency powers are the powers that underpin the laws that enable his government to arrest people like Zoe Buller for posting stuff on Facebook, send in the police to storm the Queen Vic markets and stomp on any demonstrations while letting other demonstrations proceed unhindered. He doesn't need to extend the State of Emergency Act to do hotel quarantine if that's all he wants to do. Here's Matt again to explain. He's not telling you the full truth, which is he doesn't want the ability to run hotel quarantine. He wants the ability to run hotel quarantine and do anything else that is required. Absolutely everything right up to what we saw last time, locking down the public housing towers. This is unnecessary. Let me tell you why. If you are pro lockdown, pro Dan, that's okay. You're welcome here. Well, you don't need a blank check to do what he's asking. People, rational people have been saying, create hotel quarantine legislation. If you're so concerned about hotel quarantine, fine, create a hotel quarantine act. And then we can we can discuss that. We can have a, an act that enables you to lock tennis players up. Well, not tennis players. They're allowed to do whatever they want, right? Or if they're famous enough, like Miranda Kerr, Matt Damon, or um, at least Chris Pratt went and, went and um, did his quarantine in a hotel. Good job, buddy. Uh, yeah, look, we can have legislation just for hotel quarantine. We don't need a blank check. But once again, he's going for the blank check. And in that little press grab I showed you, he said we won't use it for a second longer than we need to. He always says that. He always, always says, give me this and don't worry, I won't, I won't abuse it. And this is the thing what happened last time when he said we'll get under five cases rolling average and then we'll open up and he didn't. It took another half a week or a week or two or whatever it was and changes the goalposts all the time. Do you remember that? Changing goalposts, Dan? Yes. Well, this is what enables him to do it. Sorry to be emotional about what Dan's doing, but he is is just so transparent. I stand by the C.S. Lewis quote. He's doing exactly what he thinks is right for the population. And it's clear to me he's got a righteousness savior complex and he wants to be lauded as the savior of Victoria. Uh, but we've got to stop this guy because the worst tyrants in history were exactly this. Those who persecute people with the approval of their own conscience because they're doing it for your own good. They are the most dangerous tyrants of all. All right. I need to go chill out. I wonder if he went for a run. Did the pink shoes get a workout, Matt? That's what I want to know. That's Matthew Wong in Discernible's Melbourne studio there. And Matt will be updating his legal analysis for us during the week. So make sure you come back to Discernible and check it out. And while you're there, why not subscribe to Discernible so you don't miss any of our videos. Maybe Dan's big announcement about the state of emergency was to draw attention away from the other big Victorian news of the day. The Public Accounts and Estimates Committee report into the hotel quarantine fiasco was tabled in Parliament on Tuesday. And guess what? It found that the decision to use private security guards was made by the Department of Premier and Cabinet. The report said the decision was more likely than not made by Premier Daniel Andrews Department Secretary Chris Eccles and was endorsed by Andrews. Mr Eccles, of course, resigned his role as Secretary of the Department of Premier and Cabinet in October last year. The report also found that 99% of Victoria's second wave of COVID-19 cases was the result of the outbreak from the hotel quarantine program. The Australian newspaper says that the report revealed ministers would regularly avoid answering questions during those hearings and accused the Labor committee chair of going to incredible lengths to interrupt questioning, wasting time or even muting non-government members' microphones on matters that ministers were sensitive about. 
Why, oh, why, good burgers of Victoria, do you put up with this mob? Foreign policy blunder of the week goes to New Zealand's Trade Minister Damien O'Connor, who told CNBC that Australia could mend ties with China by showing China's government more respect. Um, you know, we have free and frank discussions with them, and I guess that honesty um, and frankness is something that China appreciates. We certainly do uh, from our side. Um, look, I can't speak for Australia in, in the way it runs its, its diplomatic um, uh, relationships, but clearly um, if they were to you know, follow us and, and show respect, I, I guess a little more diplomacy from time to time and, and be cautious with wording, um, then, then they too hopefully could be in a similar situation. I am completely lost for words. That is simply the most naive thing I've heard a politician say in recent years. And that's saying something. Apart from being an apologist, for all of China's atrocities against the Uyghurs, Hong Kong, human rights generally, aggressive military posturing all over the world, it shows a serious lack of understanding about how the communist Chinese government thinks and how it operates. China will never respect any country that shows it weakness. They don't play that game. They play power games and they treat foreign policy as a chess game. They laugh at Western countries like New Zealand for their naivety. And no wonder, with Damien O'Connor and his PM Jacinda the Socialist at the helm. The last place we should ever be taking advice from on China is New Zealand. Last week, you'll recall, I mentioned that China had been loudly proclaiming that it had upgraded and re-signed its 2008 trade deal with New Zealand. That was a clear move to put pressure on Australia. Remember what I said about how communists operate? You be a good boy now, Australia, just like that little girl next door, and we'll give you some goodies too. That we wrongly took away from you in the first place. Sound familiar? You don't back down with bullies like China. You don't back down to communist tactics. You stand up to them, or they'll never respect you. You'll learn that lesson soon enough, Damien O'Connor, but probably too late for the good Kiwis who foolishly voted you back into office last year. One of the best interviews I've seen in quite a while popped up a week or so ago on my favourite Australian podcast. That's my favourite Australian podcast that's not on Discernible or The Good Source. It's former Deputy Prime Minister John Anderson's interviews on YouTube. These are great discussions of classical liberal and conservative ideas with excellent guests. John Anderson spoke recently with lifelong Democrat Dr. William, sorry, Dr. Warren Farrell. Farrell is an American teacher, political and social commentator and author who first came to prominence as a leader in the feminist movement throughout the late 20th century. Nowadays, he's much more concerned with what he calls the boy crisis and the fact that the feminist movement seems to have gone off the rails into woke lunacy. He has a famous TED talk that you might have seen about the boy crisis. If you haven't seen it, do check it out. Well, Warren has been chosen by the Financial Times as one of the world's top 100 thought leaders. And he wrote an essay recently about the importance of unity and understanding your opponents following the US election. The critical need for much greater empathy than we're seeing in the US and Australia right now. This is a long clip I'm going to show you from it because I just can't bring myself to cut it down any more than I have. The insights from both men are just terrific. The full interview is just under an hour, and I really urge you to watch or listen to it. You know where to find the clip, the link, rather. So here's a little taste of the recent interview between John Anderson and Dr. Warren Farrell. In a part, what you're saying in this essay is that the same rules that apply to the, the way in which we can heal our own relationships at close quarters apply to the way you heal a nation after the First World War perhaps with some naivety and not enough follow through, the Americans saw the lack of wisdom in the European approach summarised by Clemenceau after the First World War, let's squeeze the German orange until the pips squeak. The yes. result of that, another horrendous war only a couple of decades later. It was yes. a disaster all round. Contrast that with the American predominance after the Second World War when they did two remarkable things Perhaps it's the Irish expression, walk a mile in someone else's shoes before you judge them. Uh, they went into Japan, left the emperor there, went about restoring peace, setting up democracy and rebuilding the economy. Japan is now a friend and an ally 
and a very responsible global citizen. Think of the Marshall Plan, uh, America an unpopular president at the time. It's important to note that Truman's opinion polls showed that he was deeply unpopular, but he had the courage to work with George C. Marshall to set up the Marshall Plan, $13 billion at that time, a staggering amount of money given to the Europeans two or three years after the Second World War to rebuild a place that was shattered and in a worse mess than it had been when Hitler committed suicide. They rebuilt, they reached out, they found common ground with their enemies and put that aside and worked to build a better future. What has happened to that understanding of leadership that the Americans demonstrated so brilliantly at times. You know, when Hitler, uh, when Germany felt it was just disgraced after World War I, um, there was there was room available. The pain was great for Germany. The the put down was great. They were they were considered the deplorables. And when the pain is great enough, the snake oil salesman becomes credible. When the when the when the price is high enough, the prostitute appears. And Hitler was the snake oil salesman, and Trump is the snake oil salesman um, that became credible because we there was such pain on the part of people who felt they were heard, they were not heard, that the, that the, that they were discounted, that they were deplorable, and that has been the huge mistake um, of 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 the you know that that led to I think. Um, the need for somebody to say, stick up from my side, and no matter how much of a snake oil salesman he was, um, and how narcissistic he was, all of that was forgiven. Uh, we have you know, the great gift of uh, if Biden does become a, a healer, which is going to be a very challenging thing to do, and I hope I um, outline a way to do that um, in that in that article, is that is that he he will create an alternative to the approach of viewing our opponents as intolerable embodiment, embodiments of evil um, and ourselves as infa infallible incarnations of enlightenment. Um, today, we have Democrats who call themselves progressives. Well, exactly what does, what does that say about what you think of the people who disagree with you? Are you regressive? Are you Neanderthals? Conversely, we have Republicans who call themselves patriots. Well, does that suggest that somebody who doesn't agree with you is a traitor? We have to hear that the people who disagree with us need to be heard, not dishonored, and be conscious of the words we use, like progressive and patriot, to make ourselves into this um, in incarnation of enlightenment, uh, while our opponents are you know, the embodiment of evil. I, I understand exactly what you're saying. And again, from my own experiences, when I was um, in, in government in Australia, we had a right wing movement that emerged in Australia. And the prime minister of the day was wise enough not to fall into the trap of describing that movement uh, led by a, a lady as uh, their supporters as being deplorables or language like that. He said, no, yes. we need to go and understand why they feel so disaffected because many of them are actually fine Australians. And so we went out and, and, and I actually did a lot of the polling to find out why people in the regional areas of the state of Queensland in our country in particular felt that they were no longer respected, they were no longer seen as um, uh, fully paid up members of the Australian family. What could we do to address their legitimate concerns? And we set about doing that. Yes. And it just seems to me to be so important for the world that the incoming administration understands that lesson because the failure to do so will alienate forever those people who produced that great upset. And the staggering fact is that huge numbers of Americans who might be described as quite conservative in their personal morality and their personal life, strongly supported Donald Trump, even though you would hear them say things like, I wouldn't necessarily want to live next door to Donald Trump. <laughs> he is doing the things that I think matter. And so there's something there and that that has to be heard. And, and so and Biden so far has been doing two things. One has been very good. And I think one has been very not so good. And the good thing is that he's he has instead of 
getting involved w- with him and Harris um, at the at the uh, on the impeachment and taking sides and putting um, Trump down and saying he's a you know a criminal and so on. He's re- he and Harris have remained above the fray. That I applaud him for. On this, but the opposite of that has also happened. He's been saying when the, on day one, when I get into office, I will reverse all of Trump's executive orders. And now that is exactly leaving every single Trump supporter or Republican who feels that there was some value in in having an executive order that took away regulations that turned out to be dysfunctional because all regulations have have with them uh, unintended consequences. And it's it's helpful to look at those regulations that you make on business or, or um, uh, years later and say, which ones have been functional and which ones have been dysfunctional. Certainly Biden can, can find some of 110 executive orders that um, Trump did, certainly he can find two, three, or four that are that were useful and important, and and highlight them rather than highlighting uh, the uh, the one saying I'm going to reverse everything he did uh, right away. Second, if Biden really wants to be a healer, he needs to do the first thing: a tour of the reddest of red states, hearing everything. And you know, people say to me, well, what do you think you should say? And the answer is very little. Yep. The, the first- I, I st- really get that. That's Dr. Warren Farrell, American teacher, political and social commentator and author of The Boy Crisis, speaking with former Australian Deputy Prime Minister and National Party leader, John Anderson. One of America's best conservative thinkers is media host Dennis Prager. Prager is the man who started the social media platform PragerU to counter the very slick left-wing propaganda that was being pumped out to university-age kids on a daily basis by organizations such as Vox, The Young Turks, and Now This. This week, in his fireside chat video, Prager gave some insight into how conservatives feel when being lectured to about unity. He told his audience that President Joe Biden's calls for unity are sweet, but meaningless, because it's all about unity on their terms and values. It's worth checking out. Here's a clip. Nobody disunites America as much as as the folks on the left. (laughs) They're the ones who divide us by race, not conservatives. Conservatives don't give a damn about race. The, the people who go around saying every white is, is, a, is a racist, every white is a white supremacist, color matters, they're calling for unity? Oh, that's what calls for a vomit bag. I mean, that, that's, that's nausea making. There, we conservatives believe in one American family because we don't give a damn about color. The color of your skin is as important as the color of your hair or the color of your shoes. But to the to the Democrats and the left, which are indistinguishable now, oh, that's really important. So this is a gay American and this is a Hispanic American and this is a black American and this is a white American and this is an Asian American and this is the crowd calling for unity. That's really phony. Okay. Joe Biden has signed a record number of executive orders since becoming US president, undoing with the stroke of a pen or few, a lot of what Trump had put in place. You may recall that during the election campaign, Biden criticized how much Trump used executive orders, calling it the behavior of a dictator. We are a democracy. Some of my Republican friends and some of my Democratic friends even occasionally say, well, if you can't get the votes by executive order, you're going to do something. Things you can't do by executive order unless you're a dictator. We're a democracy. We need consensus. Hmm. Things have changed kind of fast, Joe. In two weeks, President Biden signed 42 executive orders. That's an unprecedented pace. This week, he signed four on racial equity alone. Fox News says the orders focused on bringing equity, not equality, to private prisons, housing, COVID relief, and tribal relations. Fox host and commentator Greg Gutfield says to the critical race theorists on the left, 
Racism is everywhere. Equality, as you know, means you have the opportunity to try something even if you're bad at it. I can try to play basketball. I will suck. But in America, I have an opportunity to try, just like I have the opportunity to become an electrical engineer, a pipe fitter, or a Peloton instructor. I would suck at those too, but it's against the law to discriminate against me. It's about equality of opportunity, not equality of outcome which is what equity promises, equality of outcome, a reserved space based on the single variable of systemic discrimination. Your equity becomes an entitlement. So even though I suck at basketball, there should be a place for me in the NBA. Equity not only ignores competence, it reduces the diversity of talent that comes from opportunity, as well as ignoring how people choose different things. Shall we create female quotas for loggers and roofers and garbage collectors and other male-dominated jobs, even if women don't want them. You know, workplace death for men is 10 times higher than women. Do activists seek equity there, or is it just the cush jobs thereafter? And of course, with equity, you, need, you will need someone to decide who gets what. And that's what this is really about, power. The power to remake society, to placate the critical race theorist who works with only one variable, revenge. It's about the furthest you can get from unity, not that Joe would know or care. An excellent little editorial there from Fox News' Greg Gutfield. Well, it's time for our weekly education segment on liberalism. A great series you can check out are the videos from the Hoover Institution at Stanford University in San Francisco. In particular, the leading US economist and thinker, Thomas Sowell. Thomas Sowell has published more than a dozen books, including his classic volume, Basic Economics. In this interview, recorded around 10 years ago, Professor Sowell explains clearly how wealth is created. Wealth is created uh, when the circumstances are such that people who know how to create it are free to do so. Uh, one of the things that pains me in the current crisis is people are saying that Congress really needs to do something to make the economy recover. No, they need to let the economy recover. That the economy did not get to be the, the biggest in the world by politicians doing things. All the millions of other people that we, whose names we don't even know, those are the people who made it the, the, the biggest economy in the world. And if politicians will get out of their way, uh, we, we, we can and, and let the economy recover, it can do that. This interview with Thomas Sowell was recorded only a few years after the global financial crisis. Like the COVID crisis, governments just started printing money, or handing out free money at least, to keep the economy moving. It's called stimulus economics, or quantitative easing, if you want to make it sound fancy. The problem with printing more money is that if your economy has a certain amount of value in it, and there's cash floating around worth a trillion dollars to represent that value, if you create another trillion dollars worth of money without adding any more real value to the economy, all you're doing is making what was worth one trillion dollars yesterday equal to two trillion dollars today. You've devalued your currency and caused inflation. A hamburger that cost a dollar yesterday must rise to two dollars today. And you're halving the value of people's savings. That's the really bad thing. You're punishing the people who did the right thing and rewarding those who didn't. It's not a great plan. Fed Chairman Ben Bernanke announced this past autumn that the Federal Reserve would engage in a new round of, quote, I'm using his term, quantitative easing, the so-called QE2. The Fed will purchase, Tom, wipe that smile <laughs> off your face. This is serious, this is serious. The Fed will purchase some 600 billion of treasury instruments to keep interest rates low and spur economic growth. That's Ben Bernanke. Mm. On the other hand, we have our colleagues at the Hoover Institution, John Taylor, Mike Boskin, and John Cogan, signing an open letter to Ben Bernanke, which read in part, quote, we believe the large-scale asset purchase plan should be discontinued. The planned asset purchases risk currency debasement and inflation, and we do not think they will achieve the Fed's objective of promoting employment, close quote. Whose side is Tom Sowell on? Oh, I'm on the side of people who say they should, shouldn't have done it. Easy. Another easy one. Oh, my gosh, yes. There, there used to be a phrase for this. It was called monetizing the debt. It means that, that the, the, tre the Treasury Department has deficit spending, so they put out all these bonds that they're selling, and if the public won't buy them, the Federal Reserve will buy them because they, the Federal Reserve can legally print its own money. 
So it's no problem for this Federal Reserve to buy them. It's just that that's what that amounts to is one, inflation, and two, it amounts to a hidden tax, which will not be confined to the rich, as, we, as they call it. I mean, in other words, if you've got uh, X thousands of dollars in your bank account and the Federal Reserve starts printing more money, it is simply stealing the value of the money that you've put aside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and so that, that's the same thing as a tax, only it's, it's an inflation tax. A much better way to stimulate the economy, according to classical liberal economics, is tax cuts. Professor Sowell explains that lowering taxes can paradoxically leave the government with more money. What, what, what is painful to me, really, looking back, that this argument is not a new argument. This argument was made in the 1920s. People were saying the same thing on both sides they're saying right now. The difference is that 75 years have elapsed, and there have been four administrations of, two, of both parties that have reduced high tax, income tax rates every single time. Name them. Uh, the Coolidge, Kennedy, Reagan, and George W. Bush. Right. Every single time, the reduction in the tax rates has led to an increase in tax revenue. So I hear people on television saying how the government can't afford to give, to give this tax cuts to the rich. You know, not giving anything to anybody. Right. Uh, uh, here's a question about Ricochet contributor Steve Manasek. Quote, it's as close to dogma as there is among conservatives that cutting taxes, particularly marginal rates, spurs economic growth. But Bill Clinton raised taxes including marginal rates, and the economy boomed. Do tax rates really matter to economic growth? And if they do, how do you explain the Clinton expansion? I haven't looked at the Clinton expansion, but I know that the Clinton, uh, quote, surplus, was surplus taxes, are, uh, that those laws are passed in Congress. All spending and taxing bills originate in the House of Representatives. Right. And when the House of Representatives is, a, is in the hands of the opposite party, I don't know how any president can take any credit for what, 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 whether there's a surplus or not. Okay. Uh, Milton, Milton Friedman defined a surplus as when the money comes in so fast that even Congress can't spend it. <laughs> <laughs> That's Professor Thomas Sowell speaking in 2010 to the Hoover Institution at Stanford University in San Francisco. And we'll put the link to that series in our program notes. It's excellent and even more relevant to Australia today than 10 years ago when it was recorded. The free money handouts have got to stop. All we're doing is kicking the can down the road for our kids to pay off. Well, it's time for a laugh. This week's comedy clip comes from Dry Bar Comedy in the United States. Brandon Vestal is hysterically funny in this clip from back in July. Republicans aren't real people, says Brandon. At least that's what the Democrats in California will tell you. I'm not a political guy. I don't, I can't get in. It's just exhausting to me. It seems like just ugh. But I have picked up on this, I uh, living in California. If you're a Republican in California, you better keep that to yourself. <laughs> Ooh -wee. They hate Republicans. They don't hate anything more than Republicans in California. Republicans, they're not even real people. They're like these mythical creatures that hide in the bushes. Now snatch up your kids and force them to get a job. There's an app in California that tells you if Republicans live in your neighborhood. I've seen it. There's little elephant heads on the houses. <laughs> I feel sorry for Republicans. It's rough for them out there. They can't slip up. They gotta hide all the time. They can't say what they mean. They can't one day be with their California friends and be like, you know what? I think life begins at conception. I'm like, what? <laughs> What'd you just say? I said, I love paying for other people's contraceptives. <laughs> <laughs> Such a divided nation right there. No, I don't know how you fix it. It's scary, you know, and I, you know, the 2020 election's starting, so that'll probably, that'll bring us back together. <laughs> oh, <for sure. laughs> you hear growing up, I'm sure you heard it, everyone hears it, especially lately, you hear, you gotta express yourself. 
got to express yourself. Always be confident enough to express yourself. The world would be a much better place if everyone could just express themselves. Well, we're about 10 years into social media now and everyone can express themselves. What do you think? <laughs> I don't like it. <laughs> well, Scott, how interesting would it be if you could tell our founding fathers about Twitter? <laughs> if you could break that to them, they'd blow their mind. <laughs> Everyone can say anything they want, anytime? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're taking away that First Amendment. We're not going to have that. <laughs> Bring it back in. Don't print anything. Get everyone back, we gotta have another meeting. Because <laughs> when they gave us the freedom of speech, that's back when everyone lived in farms. And he's like, yeah, say whatever you want. No one's gonna hear you, who cares? <laughs> like if you want to talk some smack to George Washington, you had to get in a buggy. <laughs> and it took like three months to go 20 miles. Half your family was gonna die of smallpox <laughs> on the way. Man, it'd blow their mind. They'd probably be like, well, the people talking are the educated people, right? It's obviously people that know what they're talking about. <laughs> no, not at all. No. <sighs> what, does the president take part in these things? Yeah. That's US comedian Brandon Vestal, one of the best stand-ups I've seen in ages from Dry Bar Comedy. That full clip can be found on YouTube at the link we'll put in the program notes for you. Check it out. And that is it for another week on The Other Side Australia. We'll be back next week with more for your weekly summary to Australia's best classical liberal political commentary from around the web and mainstream media. If you like the show, please support us by subscribing on every platform you can find. We're on Discernible at discernible.io and we're on the Good Source platform. We're on Facebook and all the podcast platforms like Spotify and iHeartRadio and Apple Podcasts. But there's nothing that will help us grow faster than you sharing and telling your friends about the show. And if you don't like the show, here's your chance to learn how the free market works. You don't need to cancel me or shut me up. You just need to stop watching. Very easy. It's called freedom of choice. But you might want to keep watching so you can learn more about that. It used to be a big thing in Australia. All right, folks, you have a great week. Uh, don't let the woke kids get you down. We'll catch you next week. Mm -hmm.